Hello and thanks for logging on. It's Countdown to Indy here live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway alongside Chris Widlick. I am Chris Hagen. We're getting ready for the 107th running. We need a guest for today's show, Chris. What do you think? I think we've got a good one, too. Someone that's going to be driving in this race on Sunday, Let's too. bring in Ed <laughs> Carpenter, driver of the number 33, BitNile.com Chevrolet, getting ready to make his 20th start in this huge race, the greatest spectacle in racing. How do you feel from year one to now your 20th start? I'm sure there's the whole range of emotions and memories. I don't feel as old as it seems like I should, haven't been around this long, but no, I feel feel great. You know, it's always a very exciting week coming into the race. We've got a couple hours of practice left, but you know, I was with the team this morning just going through final decisions, but I feel really relaxed, which to me is a good sign. I'm confident in my car and the BitNile.com Chevy, as you said, had a really good two weeks of preparation and can't wait for Sunday. Again, the fastest Chevy on your team in the field is Renus VK starting up front. Yet again, uh, you're starting, what, 13th? 13th, yeah. And Connor is starting 16th. You just missed that shootout. Was that a little frustrating for you on qualifying day? Yeah, I mean, it, it was. Um, I think some years I probably would have been more frustrated. We, it was .06 of a mile an hour before lap, so nothing. That's the same distance Renus was from getting pole. Uh, but I, I felt fine with it. You know, I, I didn't feel like we had a pole car. So 13th, second, it's a 500-mile race. I know it will be a factor in the end. Ed, the only driver owner in the series, and nine of the last 11 500s, one of your team cars, has been on that front row. So that's kind of the standard. But also now it's about getting there. You've, got like, you've had like three poles. You've had several top ten finishes. You've been in the top five runner-up one year. Now it's all about crossing that finish line first. Yeah, we've got the going fast part figured out. We just have to <laughs> figure out how to lead lap 200 of this 500-mile race. So that's, that's all I've been focused on the whole time, really, which is – Back to the previous question, why I think I was okay being 13th, just because I've been so focused on the race. There's no going back to a previous question. Once you've given your answer, that's, that's what we stick with. I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Bree, your PR manager, and she's one of the best out there, she threw out some incredible numbers. You mentioned the ninth time in 11 years a front row car in the team. 11 out of 12 years, at least one car on the team has qualified in the first three rows. What is it about your team that you figured out that speed there, there's, uh, you've I mean, unlocked the, uh, the we've, the we've secret. got a great group of people you know this will this is our 11th year um and we've got 11 people of our original 17 from 2012 and i think the continuity especially at the leadership positions you know we're just able to keep building and getting better and which is why i'm confident for sunday you think about all the traditions and nobody knows it better than you. Part of it is, unlike any other race, you know, other places you show up, you practice, qualify, let's go racing, but there's so much buildup in between when you qualify. How do you pace yourself and realize, okay, I'd, I'd like to go race this thing now, but you have, you know, stupid things like this to do before race day? Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's where being an old, old time veteran pays off. You just get used to the cadence and, you know, you learn how to manage your emotions and actually relax. You know, we've got days off and, actually take that time to relax. I was able to go watch my daughter compete in a, a regional track and field meet last night. So do some normal things and, you know, get get out of your own head. And I obviously think about the race all the time and every day, but, you know, you've got you've to relax and pace yourself. It's a long week. Those short downtime periods are critical, aren't they, to, to get away and, and to refocus? Yeah, I mean, I think you refocus and, more importantly, recharge, you know, when you're, when you're just constantly – you have to constantly think about it, but at the same time, you've got to give yourself a break, you know, to, to be your best and to be fresh. Now, some breaking news today. We learned that uh, Catherine Legg in the 44 car and now Graham Rahal in the 24 car after that incident on Monday, that those two will be allowed to go out and do some install laps. They won't do full laps. It'll just be in and out of the pits. Uh, not only good for them, but probably good for the field as well. Yeah, I think it's, it's smart. It's something they haven't done in the past, and it was discussed in some off-season rules meetings and you know, it's safer for everyone. They can go out and make sure the cars are safe. I mean, they just they crashed at over 220 miles an hour. I think the Catherine's car is the same. The car Graham will be in will be a different car. But, you know, it's, it's safe for them. It's safe for the field. So when we all go out for practice Friday with the 33 starters for the Indianapolis 500, you know, they at least know what they have under them a little bit. You hate it for Steph Wilson, the fact that he had qualified that car. He needs uh, had back surgery today. But on the other end of that spectrum, Graham, 
you would talk to him how disappointed he was, how sad it was to not make the race. And now you never know what you'll get in Indy. Now he's back in the show. Yeah, the range of emotions from, you know, Ray Hall cars knocking each other out of the race and then Stefan having his his misfortune with also a Ray Hall car involved. You know, it's it's been a wild week for for all those parties involved. And, you know, you're happy for Harvey and, you know, now happy for Graham and you know, really feel for Stefan. You know, he works year round just for this event. Um, and he deserves to be here, and I'm sure he'll be back. We know there's two engine manufacturers in the series, Honda and Chevrolet, and the Ray Hall Letterman team has been locked in with Honda for years. Graham said that's all he's known. Now he's moving over to a Chevrolet for the first time. We were a little bit surprised that it went so smoothly, the switchover. With your owner hat on, was that a surprise to you, and what does it take for that to happen? Um, I guess I wasn't as surprised as others. You know, I've worked with Chevy my whole existence as a team, much like they've worked with Honda. And Chevrolet, they're very, very classy. They're a great partner to all the teams, and they really do kind of step aside and put their own emotions out of it when when it comes to the team doing what's best for them. And, you know, in this moment, Graham was the best choice. He, did, he also deserves to be in the race. And, you know, I think they can easily enough, you know, protect their their IP and and secrets to to not lose anything once Graham goes back to his Honda. So I, I thought it was a great sign of sportsmanship between Honda and Chevrolet. And, you know, they both know how much this race means, not only to them as manufacturers, but to, to us as drivers and teams. So to be able to let the th let the whole process play out and and allow Dry and Reinbolt to, to make the decision they felt was best for them. I thought it was very classy. Also shows that really IndyCar is a massive family. It kind of everyone takes care of each other. Don't Absolutely, they? yeah. It's it's a great great community. We're fierce competitors. You know, we can get very heated on track, but you know, we we all have the same passion, which is IndyCar and the Indianapolis 500, and the right the right outcome happened. You know, last year on our uh, television show uh, Countdown to Indy, you did a great piece explaining the steering wheel. Uh, for the Chevys. Now, Graham was saying that even his steering wheel is different when he tries to, to switch over to a Chevy. Are there little details like, you know, I could hop in probably your passenger car and I'd be okay, but what are the differences he's going to face and the things that might be troublesome that we don't think of? I mean, it's it's really down to just muscle memory. You know, he's he's probably had a pretty similar configuration wheel for years. And, you know, for anybody that's played video games, if you're like an Xbox person, you know that controller, and then someone hands you a PlayStation remote, and you're like, what's this? Kind of like that. You know, it's just he's going to have to retrain his brain. His fingers are going to want to go places because there's a lot going on there. We don't actually look at the wheel all the time, so he, he's going to have to just build that up in a short amount, you know, a two-hour practice on Friday. So he'll probably have to look at it more than other guys. <laughs> You've got another piece in this year's TV show about the pit crew and the importance of the pit crew. Um, for those who don't know, how many stops roughly, maybe an average for the Indy 500, and how critical is that team for making you guys successful? On yeah, we'll have at least five pit stops over the course of the race, and you know, depending on how cautions and how the race goes, you know, we could have nine, ten stops potentially. So, you know, that's that's five to nine opportunities where it's totally not totally out of the driver's hand because we play our part in the pit stops, but there's six other team members out there that need to get their job done and execute and get us in and out of the pits in around seven seconds. So, you know, you can win the race in the pits. You can certainly lose the race in the pits. So it's something that, that our teammates and, and the over-the-wall crew, we call them, work very hard, practice daily, train just like drivers. Uh, so they're a huge part of the team. It's, it's not just the drivers in the cars. I know you're a big football guy, and you, you think about in the years with Tom Brady and Peyton Manning, you would see them go after a teammate that made a mistake. I've seen drivers get a little heated in the seat there in the pits when they feel like something's taking too long. How do you balance that emotion if you're upset with something that happened in the pits and realize, okay, now I have to get back out here and go 200 miles plus? Yeah, it's hard. You have to be careful with that, you know, because they, it's easy for me to spout off in the car, but, you know, they all care just as much as I do. So anything that I'm saying, they're probably already feeling. So it, most of the time it doesn't need to be said, you know, I try to use the carrot more than the stick in <laughs> cases like that and just, you know, get them, get them picked back up and focus for the next one. I get your thoughts as a team owner and the month of May schedule. Is there anything that you would tweak to make it better? Uh, or, or do you like the way the situation stands right now? I mean, I think the format's pretty exciting right now. You know, I, there's part of me personally that preferred the previous qualifying format where we didn't have as many attempts, like you made it in the fast nine and that was it. Now we have a round of 12, then a round of six. Um, 
I kind of liked the less opportunities. I thought it, you know, was an advantage for me. But I think from an entertainment standpoint and, you know, people watching on TV and especially the fans that come out to the track to spend a, a full Saturday, Sunday watching us qualify, I think the current format's very entertaining. All about the drama. People love the drama, Absolutely. right? <laughs> what are you talking about now to go out there and try to compete for pole? You need to put together 30 miles worth of quality laps and go out there and get it done again. And talking to some of the drivers afterwards, they said, like you said, it's it's great drama, but that's stressful. It's the hardest thing to do in motorsports, go out there and qualify for a 500. Hey, that was great. You were fastest. Now go do it again. And now go do it again. Yeah, and that's that's why I kind of like the old, not, I like qualifying. I, I don't mind doing more attempts, but I think there's, it, it allows for more mistakes, you know, when you've got to be the top 12, you maybe put together a 10th place run, you know, that wouldn't have got you into the top nine in the old format. So I, there's there's more margin for error in a way now because you do get more attempts. So I don't mind doing more attempts. It's, I enjoy, I love going fast. I think, you know, my teammate and two, Alex Blow and Renus VK put up 235 mile an hour laps and I was jealous. Like I can't wait to see that speed pop up on my dash. So uh, hopefully next year. As far as race day is concerned, everyone's got their own way of doing things and preparing. Do you, are you locked into the same system for the 500 race in the morning? Yeah, if it, I mean, it's very routine. You know, I'm, I'm definitely not a superstitious guy, but the, the schedule is a schedule and Bree that, that manages that. You know, we keep it very similar year to year. And I think it's important to me just because it's it keeps you in the flow and the same cadence year to year to as you build up that that energy leading into the start of the race, you know you want to keep it as much the same as possible. Here's what always gets me as we goes back to football again. Imagine at the Super Bowl, and before the game, Tom Brady or Peyton Manning, they're they're going out and meeting sponsors and shaking hands and going. Around. That that's so crazy to me that you guys are going to go out there and do something way more dangerous than a, a football game. <laughs> How do you balance all that? You got to glad hand people, you got to smile, and you know I know I know it's fun to walk out there with your family, but it's so unique to this race and this sport. I think that's one of the cool things about IndyCar. You know, I think we have more of that than really any other form of motorsport, especially open wheel racing. And it's it's always been part of it for me. So you just get used to it. But you know, the how open our paddock is, how much fan engagement there is up close and personal, people in the garages seeing the cars, being that close to it. I think I think it's what makes us unique, and and why when people do come to our events, they want to come back. Is it fair to say maybe half the field has a realistic chance of winning on Sunday? Is that is that not enough? I mean, I, I think so. You know, I mean, obviously the 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 favorites are the favorites for a reason. But 500 mile races are, are really really hard, and you see all whether it's a rookie or veterans like Scott Dixon's mistake last year speeding in in pit lane. You know, you don't think things like that are going to happen, but there's so many ways that you can lose a race as long as this one and yeah I think the quality of the field and teams is deep enough that yeah it's really really hard to predict where it's going to come from. He's Ed Carpenter driver of the number 33 bitnile.com Chevrolet part of the traditions of the month of May is he's always our leadoff guest for countdown to Indy here on the webcast so for Chris Woodlick and Ed Carpenter I'm Chris Hagan thanks for logging on we'll see you right back out here tomorrow live from the Speedway 12 noon eastern time.